All right, so we're going to get into this message today. So in preparing to hear today's message, we have to remind ourselves of the past couple of weeks. We've been introduced to the individual as Stephen. We've been introduced to him, and today we're going to see the conclusion of his story. Usually, there's so many, except for the top players in a, uh, in a Bible passage, we usually see somebody for a couple of verses and only for a couple of verses. But as we look at the scripture, we see Stephen play out over a course of a couple of chapters. And remember, the book of Acts is about the early history of the church. When you start seeing him take up this much real estate, there must be something about Stephen that matters. As Steve Kajawa walks into the room, Steve, you matter. <laughs> but here's the thing that I want you to hear about this, is that... Stephen all of a sudden goes from just role player in the church to elevate it to a higher platform. We see him begin to serve the widows and become one of the first deacons. He had a teaching ministry. He was very vitally important for this young developing church. He understands that the apostles are being persecuted, yet he says, you know what, no matter what they're going through, no matter what they're walking through, I'm joining in, I'm signing up, I don't mind being persecuted because I know the name of Jesus Christ is going to be lifted high. That would have been a perfect spot for an amen. The name of Jesus is going to be lifted high. But the problem that we run into in the church today is this, we don't like being persecuted. We don't like it when it gets difficult. We don't like a challenge because, oh, that's somebody else's role. We need, we're going to pray that God would reduce the persecution. No, bring the persecution on. This is why I'm thinking that Satan doesn't want to hear this message. And I think, what, four mics got thrown into my hands this morning and all of them stopped working the second they got into my hand. Because when the church is persecuted, the church grows. But so often, well, I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to go through a difficult time. For the majority of us in this room, we will probably never truly be persecuted to the level that the early apostles did and believers around the world are being persecuted today. Yeah. We get upset because, oh, I can't go out and boycott this without people being mad at me. No, there is people around the world today that are meeting in underground houses and meeting in caves because if they say the name of Jesus... Not even as a pastor, but the name of Jesus. If they're found with a copy of the Bible in their hands, what happens to them? They go to jail. They're put to death. But how many of us have multiple copies of this book and we think, you know, I really should open that today. This is life and death for some people. And for us, it's a matter of does it get 10 minutes of my day? And so he walks into this saying, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow what God calls me to do. If God wants me to serve in this capacity, I will serve in this capacity, and I will do it with joy. And he gets himself arrested. He gets the opportunity to begin sharing of a defense of, of his, of why is it that he's doing what he's doing. And he begins to go into this whole uh, conversation of what brought them to this day about how, no, this isn't me that's wrong. I'm not speaking against Moses. I'm not speaking against the temple. You are. Here's why. And bring it on. And so we're going to get into today to see the rest of what happens and see the, the, the rest of the story of what's going to happen to Stephen. But before we do, would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, Heavenly God, your, word is written, your word is written in my mind, in my mind and hidden and in, in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. My greatest desire is to be a disciple and to make more disciples. I will live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. This is Acts 7, 54, verses through 8a. Eight, eight, or 8, 8, 8, 8. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of their city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went out to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him, they saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Here's the thing. Anyone who preaches long enough, anyone who shares the name of Jesus long enough, will eventually offend somebody. In today's world, all it takes is about three sentences out of your mouth and you can offend somebody. That one of the news stories that I, I saw this past week is one politician referenced the fact and made up a, a bit of a story about how his um, father was attacked by cannibals and that apparently uh, affected and offended the cannibals. <laughs> if it was true, that's kind of what cannibals do. You can't get offended when somebody gets upset with you. If he's not telling the truth, then why are we making up stories about cannibals? And why at the same time would the cannibals be upset? You know what? We've ate a lot of people, but we didn't eat that guy. <laughs> <laughs> when it, it comes with the territory that people say and do stupid things. Raise a hand if you've said or done something stupid in your life. Like, I got both up. I, I know I've done both things. And I remember one of the first times I ever preached a message on a Sunday morning at Northville Christian. I'm not going to say this individual's name, just on chance that this is on the internet and they might see it. But uh, I, I'm pretty sure this person would know exactly who they are. But basically, I got up and I remember being nervous because this is my first time, as I think I was probably around 22 or 23. I'm preaching in front of a room similar to this for the very first time. I've, I've talked with kids, I've talked with teenagers, but I've never talked with a room full of adults before. And I'm thinking there's individuals in this room that have been Christians two to three times longer than I've been alive. What do I have to offer them? How many of you ever kind of felt that way before? Of like, I don't ever, like, let, let that person tell them about Jesus. Let that person preach the good news of Jesus because they know more than me. No, we need you. We need you to step up and do what God's called you to do. Well, in this particular case, I get up there, I finally, I've, I've worked down uh, the nerves enough, and I feel like, okay, I can do this. And I remember passionately preaching, and here's the thing, I can tell you about the way I preach when I preach passionately. I get faster. You can kind of hear it this morning, that I, I preach faster when I get passionate. When my voice goes up, my voice goes a little bit quicker. And on this particular morning, my voice went up, my voice went <laughs> a little bit quicker, and I got done, and she was the first person that came up to me. And in comparison to Norfolk Christian, it would be someone that would be sitting in this area, and all of a sudden, she said to me, you know what? You did a great job today. And you get that feeling, I did, didn't I? <laughs> but, there's always that but. See, here's something. If you're going to give, like, a criticism to somebody, I love the hamburger method where, like, praise, criticism, praise. And when you give the praise, actually mean the praise. <laughs> actually mean it. So basically, it was just a, you did great today. No, no, so nothing specific of this is what you did great. It just, you did great today. I was like, oh, tell me more. <laughs> but I get the but, like, immediately. Next time you preach, go slower. You preach a little bit too fast. In fact, I'll help you out next time. I'll have signs, and if you start speaking too fast, I'll lift the signs that slow down. <laughs> Ironically, she probably was one of the fastest speaking individuals in the church. I could be speaking one-on-one -on -one with this individual right now, and if I'm talking with her, she would be talking twice my speed, but who are you to correct me about the speed in which I'm preaching? Because if the Holy Spirit's got a hold of me, I'm going to preach the way the Holy Spirit wants me to preach. Yeah. 
And here's the thing, is as you go through the, the Bible, as you preach, one of the things I've enjoyed doing over the course of about the last four years is just preaching straight through books of the Bible. Because nobody can ever come up to me when I'm going straight through a book of the Bible. Um, I think you're just picking and choosing what you want to preach. No, I'm picking and choosing what the Holy Spirit has written down in this word thousands of years ago. So, no, I'm not just happening to speak to you. I'm preaching what God directed me to preach today when I wrote the message with the help of the Holy Spirit three weeks ago for this day. And God just brought you here. And so if you're like, well, you're reading my journal, you're reading my mail, you're reading my text messages, no, the Holy Spirit is. And so in that moment, it was that frustrating, that hurt of like, I thought I did something good. And now all of a sudden I'm being critiqued immediately over something very minuscule. But I can say this. I've never preached a sermon like Stephen where the immediate reaction was, let's just kill him now. <laughs> I hope I get through another morning, but I've done pretty good. I'm almost to seven years here of you guys not wanting to just take me out in the courtyard and stone me afterwards. So we're, we've got a good streak going on. And here's the thing. We're going to pull out a couple ideas from this passage today. The first one comes from the, the actual stoning of Stephen. And the first idea from that passage is this. Stephen stoning demonstrates spiritual warfare. You see, so often we want to say spiritual warfare. Well, this is coming up against me. No, you just said something stupid to them. Now they're upset with you. That's not spiritual warfare. That's conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. Conflict resolution would probably exist even if Satan didn't exist because it's difficult communicating sometimes. So when I say spiritual warfare, what I mean is the war of good versus evil, God versus Satan, light versus darkness. But here's the thing that I already know. We know how the book ends. Mm -hmm. We already know that God wins. This is why persecution shouldn't bother us. This is why persecution didn't bother Stephen. Because Stephen already knew Jesus won. Jesus went to the cross, Jesus died on the cross, Jesus was resurrected, Jesus ascended, and Jesus said he was coming back. If we mean all those things, and we know all those things, then we shouldn't be worried when things come up against us in this world. Because if something's going to come up against me in this world, I already know that Jesus won. This war rages on, it's in different forms, different fashions, there's physical attacks, wars against other nations in the Old Testament, we see spiritual deception, entanglement, we see issues with idol worship, we see issues with immorality, there's all kinds of things that can come up against you, and again, I said in the beginning, I'm not the person that believes that there's a demon under every rock that's just trying to get you today, that a demon turned your alarm clock off, no, you were too tired when you went to bed and forgot to set your alarm clock. But in this moment, I think there's a reason why all of a sudden the microphone just stops working. But all of a sudden, I don't know about you, I feel like I'm louder than in here right now than I ever am with a microphone. And I believe it's the fact that God wants someone in this room to hear this today. So when we get to Ephesians 6.12, we see Paul saying this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We need to remember, particularly in situations where we are facing authentic persecution, just like Stephen, that these things that come up against us, that the things, the people that come up against us are not our enemies. Let that sink in for a moment. People are not your enemy. I'll read the passage again. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against people but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let me just say it this way. Not only are the persecutors not the enemy, the persecutors are the goal. Let that sink into your brain this morning. The people that you would say, they are persecuting me. This person's against me. This politician is doing this. My boss is doing this. My child is doing this. My spouse is doing this. They are not the enemy. They're the goal. Yeah. They're the people that Jesus wants to, you to, to, to tell him about. They're the people that God's placed in your life that you're supposed to be doing life together with. If they're a believer, go to Matthew 18, the very fact that you're supposed to go to one another and work out your issues. And if you can't, then you bring someone else in to help you. And if that doesn't work, then you bring the church in to help you. 
The goal between believers is that we should bring back relationships together. But if it's someone who's not a believer, they're not against you. There's someone that God designed, that God created, that God wants to see in heaven for eternity. Please do never come to me and say that, well, this individual, like this, this person, God just needs to like, go ahead and take them. Are you glad that God didn't say that for you? Amen. We need to be individuals that would say, Jesus, whatever it is you want, I'm going to go after that person. Because what we're about to see happen as we read through this passage this morning, we see this. Uh, and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And who is holding all the coats as that's happening? Saul. Who approved of the execution? Saul. Who just wrote that passage of scripture that I just read in Ephesians 6.12? Saul. In fact, he also writes in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. How about the people that we feel they're against me? We start praying and lifting their name on high mm -hmm. so that Jesus would do a mighty work in their name. And as Jesus does a mighty work in their name, all of a sudden you realize, oh, that person that I thought was against me. No, they're Christian. They're in Christ. Yeah. They're a new creation. Not because of my ability, not because of their ability, not because of anything I did, not because of anything they did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. <laughs> it's all about Jesus and what Jesus can do. And Paul is identifying here that I was messed up. I was the worst of the worst, but Jesus. Stephen, as a man who loves and knows God's word, as he is dying, as people, and see, you've got to understand this about Stoney. This is not like, well, let me just grab a, a handful of pebbles and throw them at this person. This is boulders. These are as big a rock as I can hold. I'm going to stand above you, and I'm going to throw this at you. And we're going to all continually throw giant stones at you until we are sure that you are no longer breathing. This is a very vicious way to die. And as Stephen is being attacked this way, what does he yell out, Lord, do not hold us against them? Yeah. He is actively not just being persecuted. He is actively being put to death. And he's saying, don't let this be on them. They don't know what they're doing. Including Saul. And as Saul is experiencing this, Saul is watching this, all of a sudden Saul is realizing that one day he's going to start being identified more as Paul than he is as Saul. And as he's identified as Paul, he's going to end up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Because it changed things when somebody said, you know what, bring on the persecution. I'm not trying to avoid it. I'm not trying to do life my own way. Bring it on. So then the other point we get out of this uh, uh, portion with the stoning of Stephen is Stephen stoning declares the true work of God in his life. God never wastes anything and works all things for his purpose. Mm -hmm. God will use this spiritual warfare to declare his work in his children's life. Notice Stephen's response. The people are rushing at him. The people are gnashing their teeth, which I've never had someone approach me gnashing their teeth before, but that's got like... I don't know about you, like I feel like whenever I go to the doctor or the, the dentist and they tell me to like, grind my teeth on purpose because they want to see if like everything is flat and like that feels awkward. So I can't imagine people actually being that mad, that clenched, that they're like intentionally gnashing their teeth in anger. And as this is happening, Stephen is still full of the Holy Spirit. He sees Christ in heaven. He vocalizes the, the vision of what he's seeing. It's just making them matter. And so he just says, receive my spirit. And it's in this persecution that all of a sudden we get that trigger moment. We get that moment where all of a sudden Saul's watching it. And this isn't the moment where Saul gets it. But this definitely has to be in the memory bank of Saul. But hear this with this idea that persecution will test our faith in a way that peace cannot. We like peace. Peace is comfortable. We'll have a day where all of a sudden we will experience peace forever in eternity. 
But in this moment where all of a sudden we find ourselves here in this world for such a time as this, there's people that desperately need Jesus. And that means we need to go and tell our story. Now, here's the great thing about each and every one of us in this room. You all know some, more about something than I do, and that's yourself. You have the opportunity to say, this is who I am, this is where I was, and this is where I am now. The thing is, so often, I believe that Satan wants to come up against you to remove your voice, to remove your desire to speak, to remove your ability to tell your story. Well, your story's not good enough. That person's story is better. That person's, that testimony, that's more powerful than yours. You just be quiet and let them then share. When the Holy Spirit is calling you to speak your testimony, there's probably a good chance that your testimony is needed for that person that, in a way that you can't comprehend. You might look at it and say, well, my testimony is boring. I never did anything significantly bad. Sure, I told a lie. Sure, I disobeyed once in a while. But I don't have this great grand story about the 37 felonies and how I was on death row and all of a sudden God released me from death row. <laughs> Man, I want to hear that story. But let me, hear, let me tell you this. For some people, that story is powerful. Oh, wow, God really can set free. For some people, they need to hear the story about how God protected you, about how God placed you into a home with solid, believing parents that were able to raise you in the ways of God, that you, you might have struggled a little bit, but God protected you, that God watched out for you, that all of a sudden they say, you know what, I have this personal story of my life falling apart, of not being good, of all these struggles, but what you're doing is giving me hope that my children or that my grandchildren can live a life differently than what my life was. Your testimony absolutely matters, and you have to look for opportunities to work that testimony into your everyday conversation. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of it. I was talking with the board at our meeting on Thursday night. That it's just amazing that all of a sudden the opportunities that you get when you're carrying a newborn baby around. Because as I'm carrying this newborn baby, uh, our, our foster son, everybody always says that, oh, can I see the baby? Sure, this is our foster son. Let me introduce you to, and then all of a sudden, like, that's amazing of you that you would you take on a foster child. And we're able to begin a conversation. In this moment, our foster son begins to be the individual that allows me to launch into a different conversation of why we would do it in the first place. What is it in your life that God has given you, the talent, the ability, the resource, the topic that you're able to work in and say, you know what, I'm going to bring Jesus into this conversation. I don't know how, but I'm going to. It's really easy when you have a foster child and people are like, I don't understand it. Why would you do that? Well, because when I was lost, when I was found, all of a sudden, God sent me for uh, Jesus for me so that I could be adopted back into the family of God. And so if God would do it for me, why wouldn't I do it for someone else? Mm -hmm. And you work it into the conversation. Evangelizing people isn't hard. We just have to do it. Because each of you have your own unique environment, your own unique individuals that you come in contact with. But we look at, well, that might bring persecution. Then bring it on. Because persecution will test your faith in a way that peace can't. You want to know for sure that you believe what you say you do? All of a sudden, when something comes up against you, you say, you know what? Okay, God, have your way. I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know the struggle that I'm in, how you're going to work it for your good, but God works all things for good for those who believe in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we need to walk with, because it's one thing to be able to, to say that verse. It's one thing to be able to read that verse. It's one thing to be able to amen that verse on a Sunday morning, but are we willing to amen and live out that verse on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? So that we come back in on Sunday and can say, you know what? God did something amazing. God did something unique. God did something. Because as I look around this room, I see the opportunity for this room to grow. There's stories that we have not yet heard. There's people that we have not yet met. There's best friends that you have not yet met yet because they have not started coming here. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we see people redeemed and changed and transformed. We'll fill this room up once. Then we'll fill it up again. And we'll just keep going because people need Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let your trials of your faith demonstrate the genuineness of your faith. The back half of this message is really kind of this idea as Saul persecuting the church. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on Saul persecuting the church because we're going to get into that more in, in some of the weeks to come. But on Easter, we reference an individual named Gam Gamaliel who was a Pharisee. He recommended limiting the persecution of the apostles, not because he was a good guy, but because if Jesus was legit, there's nothing that the uh, Sanhedrin could do 
that would impact it. That the, the goodness, the gospel, the power of God would continue going forward. If this is of God, you don't want to be on the opposing side. But if it's not of God, it's going to die like all these other movements have, have died off. His star pupil was Saul of Tarsus. That's very Saul that's being introduced in this moment. But I want to point out something about Saul. I want to see who knows this. Who knows when Saul's name goes from Saul to Paul? I'm hearing Road of the Masses. Would you guys agree with that? That's incorrect. His name never changed. His name was Saul to the Hebrews, and it was Paul to the Gentiles. His name never changes. But when you look in the beginning of the book of Acts, who is Saul interacting with? The Hebrews. And then when God all of a sudden calls him to a different people group, he all of a sudden then starts going by Paul. Because we have Saul, we have Saul and Barnabas, we have uh, Barnabas and Saul and Barnabas and Paul. His name shifts because all of a sudden it's no longer the Hebrews that I'm going after. I'm going after the Gentiles, and I'm willing to jump in with the Gentiles, and I'm willing to do life with the Gentiles. And if they call me a different, slightly different name, that's fine, because it's more important that they hear the goodness of Jesus Christ than people know my name. And today we know him by Paul because that's where all his important letters are written, but we're introduced to him as Saul. Even when we get to chapter 13, uh, verse 9, we would see the phrase, Saul also called Paul, which is after the road to Damascus happened. So why do we see Saul mentioned here? It almost feels like one of these, like, they just kind of threw it in as a plot device. Luke is a doctor, and on one hand, he is as detailed as it can be, writing detail after detail, giving an, an amazingly accurate account or history of what's going on. That this matter, he's used to writing down, okay, tell me the details. What happened, then what happened, then what happened, then what happened, then what happened. Okay, I've got a, I've got a medical case history made up. That's what he's, he's doing. But on the other hand, Luke uses a literary device on multiple occasions where he begins to introduce prominent characters, chapters, and granted, chapters and verses came later, but he introduces them well before they become main characters. I just mentioned Barnabas. You have Paul and Barnabas to become this duel that start taking the gospel everywhere, start planting churches everywhere. But Barnabas got mentioned for the first time a couple chapters ago when it said this is what Barnabas did and this is what Ananias and Sapphira did. So we've already been introduced to Barnabas, even though we haven't really seen the effects of Barnabas' ministry yet. We're now being introduced to Saul. He's kind of getting a cameo walk-on role because then all of a sudden, just like in a TV show where you watch this week and like, that individual, they look interesting. I feel like they're going to come back in the story. And three, four weeks pass, and then you get a recap of the show before the show starts. Like, oh, I remember that person. They might be coming into play, and all of a sudden they become a main character. So Luke is really kind of recording of this is who he is, this is what he's doing. And by the way, he's coming back. And so after that, that initial kind of mention that where we put the cloaks by him, that he's standing watching. We see this fact that Saul begins going into the different houses, and as he goes into the houses, he's dragging off men, he's dragging off women, and taking them to prison for their faith in Jesus Christ. That, I've got no desire to spend time in jail. But if I have to go to jail because I'm professing the name of Jesus Christ, lock me up. We have to all have that opinion. Because here's the thing, on the other side of eternity, we're going to live forever knowing the fact that we're making Jesus famous. Amen. Do you realize that in Canada right now, they are making the laws more and more difficult on believers and on pastors, and that some of the things that I would say in the course of the last couple of weeks would probably push me towards going to jail. We still have a freedom that people even in Canada don't have. So while we have it, let's make use of it. Because what happens when all of a sudden saying the very thing you're just nervous about saying today all of a sudden becomes a crime tomorrow? If you can't say it when you're just nervous about it, do you really think you're going to say it when all of a sudden your, your livelihood's at, at stake, your freedom is at stake? I don't think so. We like other people talking about it. We like other people legislating it. We like other people being involved. But when the Holy Spirit has told you to do something, you have to go and do it. Because here's what's happening here. We see this whole church that is still staying in this one spot. 
They haven't began to scatter yet, but now because of this persecution, we're about to see a move of God happen. The church begins to scatter. Acts 1.8 says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here's the thing is, up until this point, they've just stayed in Jerusalem. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, but also in Judea, and also in Samaria, and also to the ends of the earth. But to this point, they're just staying in Jerusalem because that's comfortable. I'm just going to stay right here. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to be comfortable. If what comfortable would have been is saying, hey, you know what, I'm just going to remain doing youth ministry because I understand how to do youth ministry. I'm good at youth ministry. But God began speaking something different to Andy and I and said, you know what, leave pastoring. That feels dangerous. That feels uncomfortable. I can't blame anyone if something doesn't work anymore. It's easy to say, well, the church isn't growing because of this or because of that. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, everything stops at my desk. Okay, God, what is it you want to do? Oh, there's conflict in the church. Okay, I guess I got to be involved in that. <laughs> but they didn't want to leave. Almost in a similar sense that when we look back at the Tower of Babel, and they're building the tower to try to get to heaven, God confuses their languages, and then they scatter out. When we look at the book of Acts, we have the Holy Spirit come that all of a sudden brings conformity back to the language again. And now all of a sudden, those who couldn't understand the good news of Jesus can now understand it because now they're hearing it in their own language, but now God is saying, okay, now go out. Now that I've reunified the language, now that you can understand each other again, now go out and start making these churches happen. And so we see a uh, play out that a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. I want you to notice this. It's not saying Peter went this way and John went that way. It said everybody. And remember, we're talking into thousands of people at this point. Thousands of people are beginning to scatter because it's not safe for me to be here, so let me go out here. But as I go, as I travel, I'm going to begin proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to make Jesus famous. What would seem to impede the growth of the church really just facilitates church growth. This is where Satan's best attempts at you can turn into God's best attempts to grow his church and to help other people see who he is. And let's be honest, because that's uncomfortable because you say, you know what, well, God, I have my plans. These are my hopes. These are what I want to see happen. It's not about you. It's about what God wants to do in and through you. And so sometimes he'll use regular preaching of the word, but sometimes it's a matter of saying, you know what, I'm going to do something supernatural. I'm going to act upon this one moment. I'm going to scatter you all because you wouldn't have went on your own. And as you get scattered, as you go into every little corner of the world, my name's going to, be, going to become famous. It's something that Jesus wasn't doing on his own. He was investing in this particular group of people that were going to begin investing in a bigger group of people who then were going to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It can't be just something that we say. It has to be something that we do. Tertullian, the second century church father, famously said, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. We look at things and say, you know what, I, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want to do this or do that. Do you want the church to grow, or do you just care about yourself? And worship team, if you'll go ahead and come forward. That's something that I need you to process. Because here's the thing. I really feel, over this course of this last week, that God began to speak some things to me that, like, I'm going to be careful to not over-speak right now, because I don't know how much I mean and how much still has to be fleshed out in my mind. But I look at our church's history that we are about to turn 99 years old as a church, and next year uh, we're going to turn 100 years as a church. And here's the thing. I don't want to necessarily have a moment where we are saying, well, let's celebrate all the amazing things of the past 100 years, because a lot of great things have happened in the past 100 years. I'm kind of the attitude that I want to use it as a launching point to look forward to what does year 101 look like. Because it's almost okay, now that we get a second time around on this, if God were to, to wait another hundred years, realistically, we would not be, none of us in this room will likely be around in another hundred years if God waits another hundred years. But if this church is here a hundred years from now, and they were look, to look back and say, at the midpoint of the church, 
what was said, what was done that caused the church to grow and do something crazy and amazing for, for God. In that particular moment, I would love for them to say, you know what, they reached the spot where it was no longer about them, but it was all about making Jesus famous. And they were willing to put everything aside. They were willing to do what God was calling them to do. They were willing to do something different. And when I look at it and I say, you know what, what if, what if we just made a, an audacious goal and said, you know what, right now we're averaging, we have about 350 or so people that come through the course of about a four to six week period. If everybody showed up on one week, just realize this, if everyone showed up on one Sunday who's in our church database that we just went through, so I know this is accurate, we'd have about 350 people here. Hear me. Vacations and time away are important. If you're sick, you're going to be able to watch live stream at home in a couple of short weeks. But we got to make church the priority. We have to make it a, a priority that this is what I do. This is why I do it. And I'm going to make Jesus' name famous. But imagine, let's just go off to the number of about 200. Because we tend to be somewhere between 170 and 200, uh, depending on the week. What if each of us through the course of now, in a year and a half from now, were to say, I'm going to win one person, just one person to Christ. Church goes from 200 to 400 very quickly. And here's the thing I want you to realize. One isn't hard. If all of a sudden we start looking for opportunities to make Jesus' name famous, one isn't hard. It's a matter of saying, God, who is it that you want me to meet with? Who is it that you want me to disciple? Who is it that you want me to pray for? Who is it that you want me to fast over? Who is it that you want me to get uncomfortable with? Who is it that you want me to be willing to risk persecution over? Because they need Jesus. Because all of a sudden you look at 200 going to 400. 400 becomes 800 much faster. 800 becomes 1600 even faster. A move of God starts with a group of individuals that say, you know what? I'm going to do my part. I'm going to get into God's Word. If you're not in it at all, start by reading a chapter a day. If you say, you know what, I'm going to get into giving. If you're not giving at all, just start. Start doing something. Get involved. Get some skin in the game. Because all of a sudden, when we see the church saying, you know what, here's the persecution, bring it, they scatter, and the church starts growing and starts thriving. And the very individual that in Saul that is watching and is approving ends up because of an individual that was killed and he was a standing approving of it because of that prayer saying, God, don't hold this against them. He ends up writing two thirds of the New Testament. I fully believe that we're here as a church today because of the work of Paul. Because God empowered him to do it. And he said, you know what? I know I used to be a persecutor. I know I used to be this. But my past does not get to define me. My future defines me. And who defines my future? God does. Because God holds all my days in his hands. So church, this morning, I'm just going to I'm gonna open up the altar in a moment. And if you need to come and pray, come and pray. But I do want to be intentional about one thing before we start is because I know when you have messages like this and you say, you know, okay, I'm gonna bring it. Like, I, I'm okay with being persecuted. I'm okay with the enemy coming against me if Jesus' name is made famous. When you start praying that, stuff happens. Don't pray it if you don't mean it. Because stuff happens. But in that moment, I know there's individuals that are around this world that are currently and actively being persecuted for their faith. So before we even start praying it, we're going to pray for them. If you want to have even a better understanding of it, a book like The, the Heavenly Man by uh, Brother Young the details his time in jail of what it was and how he was unwilling to go against the name of God and what that meant, but also the opportunities and the doors that it opened for him to communicate the truth and the good news of Jesus Christ. Because I want to pray for them. And then I would pray that God would give us opportunities as well. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Lord, for all of our brothers and sisters that are believers around this world, whether they're underground right now worshiping your name, whether they're worried about a loved one that just got hauled off the jail, 
whether they're facing death row right now for believing in Jesus, Lord, I pray you would come alongside them and you would strengthen them and you would encourage them. And Lord, I pray that you would use every moment of their life, whether it's about to come to an end or it's going to go on for weeks, months, years longer. Lord, I pray right now that you would strengthen them, you would encourage them, and you would allow them to continue to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus, that even their captors who are actively persecuting them because they are still the goal, God. But I pray that you would encourage them and empower them to impact even their captors so that their captors could see you and experience you and that maybe their lives could be changed just the way that Saul was. Lord, I pray that you would move in them in this moment. Lord, I pray for their loved ones that are worried about them, that you would come along and comfort them, God. And Lord, I turn the attention here to, to us let us be a church that would be willing to embrace persecution. Not that we're looking for it just for fun, but we would look for it and say, okay, God, whatever it is that you call me to do, I will gladly do it so that Jesus' name can be made famous. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. But I pray that you would move in incredible ways. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Would you just stand in the worship?